So I record my homilies so that I can go back and say, this is what I said, and let me show you why it's Catholic. So as you guys heard uh, in the beginning, at the introduction, my name is Father Chris. I'm a Franciscan. I'm really excited about today's feast day because it's a, it's a feast day that the Franciscans really uh, fought for. And also, as a Franciscan, my particular group of Franciscans were named after today's feast day. We're the province of the Immaculate Conception. And can I get the first? Um, there we go. So I did my studies in Rome, and in 2004, I got to celebrate the Feast of the Immaculate Conception with St. John Paul II. Now, I have to point out which one is me because I had hair back then. Right? You probably wouldn't recognize me. So if you see where there's the guy, like there's those folks that are kneeling there, right? And then there's a guy at the end of, that, of the group of kneelers. Oh, okay, I can do it on this side too. There we go. I didn't realize it was two-sided. Okay, so the guy in red there, well, the next guy with the hood, that's me. And then if you look all the way over there towards like this big chair, that's St. John Paul II. Isn't that cool? That was 2004, so I'm doing the math. That was 17 years ago. How many of you were alive back then? Okay, all right, not all of you, right. But it's interesting though, if we hear what the scriptures are telling us today, God already knew about you. We heard that in the second reading. God knew about you before the foundations of the world. So this is one of the things that I like about the Immaculate Conception. It's one of those things where we can sit here and go, blah, 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 about what the Immaculate Conception is, like the theory behind it, that God took grace from Jesus' death on the cross, right? And then suddenly transported that back in time to when Mary was being conceived in the womb of St. Anne, right? But who are my, who are my pot stirrers? Who are, the, who are the ones who like to ask all the questions like, how is that possible? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Yes, I love you guys because I am one of those guys. How is that possible? It doesn't make any sense from our point of view, does it? Because when we live life, we typically live life with like, okay, there's a past, there's a present, there's a future, right? And they're not all mixed together. But that's not how God does things. And we heard the angel Gabriel say it specifically to Mary, nothing is impossible with God. And one of the things about this is that We literally sometimes train ourselves with words that we don't quite understand. Or we will know something, but then not understand it. And then when we don't understand it, we're not actually able to put it into practice. So it's kind of useless, right? So that's why I'm not about just teaching stuff, only ideas. I met a guy when I was studying. Uh, He was working at Oxford University, and he had many, many doctorates, okay? But he would stand up, and when he talked about how smart he was, he would boast about not being able to change a light bulb. Can you imagine that? How many of you know how to change a light bulb? Yeah, pretty much all of us. But can you imagine, here's a guy, he's so smart. In fact, he had been on one of the president's security councils. That meant he was in charge of our national defense. I'm afraid of that. And yet, it meant that somebody would have to take care of him in order to change a light bulb. That doesn't sound like wisdom to me. That sounds like too much knowledge puffing one up. So, let's see if we can understand a little bit. This is the next step, okay? You can know this idea, okay, Mary received the grace of Jesus somehow out of order and time, and that doesn't make sense to us. But let's look at some other things that shouldn't make sense either in the Bible. My pot stirrers are getting excited because they probably asked the questions, right? How many of you ever asked the question of how Elijah 
got to go to heaven before Jesus died. Right. And he not only went just to heaven, he got taken up in heaven, body and soul. What does that look like? Anybody know what that looks like? What do we profess in our faith? Don't we profess that when Jesus comes again, he's going to raise everybody from the dead, and then those who have remained faithful to him, you know, who have called on him for forgiveness of their sins and trusted him as Savior, what's going to happen to them in body and soul? Bloop, they're going to go up to heaven. So how does Elijah get a hold of that before Jesus dies? Again, this just goes to show that with God, time doesn't matter. Time doesn't matter. Meaning that with God's kingdom, God can have something from the future affect the past. Now, who are my science geeks? I was one, so I'm not putting you down. Who are my folks who love science? How many, how many quantum physics lovers do we have out there? Yeeha. Yeah. Did you know that quantum physics right now is discovering the fact that somehow, according to quantum physics, the future affects the past? If you, if you look at any of the things that they do with experiments with light, whether it interacts as a particle or as a wave, it'll depend on whether there's a sensor at the end of the thing or not. And if there's a sensor, it'll interact one way. If there's no sensor, it won't interact that way. It'll interact a different way. But it's dependent upon something future, which is a little bit weird. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. I should have mentioned trigger warning, but not trauma. I'm going to trigger your unbelief. I'm going to literally shift your mind this morning to get out of thinking things according to the way the world thinks, the way you've been taught to think by everybody else who's ever been let down by God. And instead, get you to hunger for something more. Because I don't know about you, but we sat here and we sang a psalm this morning that said, all the ends of the earth have seen the power of God. And if you are like me when I was around your age or one of the pot stirrers that I really like to point out, you're probably thinking, yeah, right. Where have we seen the power of God? How many of you can ever say that you saw God act? I know I can. How many of you have ever heard of somebody getting healed because people were praying for them? We have a few people. Oh, show your hands a little bit higher. Don't be afraid of that. Look, look around, folks. Okay? Some people have seen the saving power of God. Because to be saved doesn't just mean to go to heaven. God didn't come among us as man in Jesus Christ in order for us simply to get to heaven. It's not like God only cares about our life after our life. Jesus said quite clearly in John's gospel, I came that they might have life and have it in abundance. So what did Jesus literally do when he came and preached the good news and said to people, listen, shift your mind, repent. That's what that means, basically. Shift your mind and begin to believe in the good news, the gospel, that God's kingdom is at hand. What did he do? And he literally said, if I'm not doing these things, don't believe me. What did he do? Come on. Some of you have read scripture. What did he do? Did he just say, be a good person? Did he just say, avoid these sins? What did he do? Crickets? How many of you have have heard of the gospel passage where Jesus heals a leper? And he does it by touching the leper. He literally broke what they said was their law of purity in order to bring God's kingdom. Because this is how powerful God is. So it was true for the Old Testament that if you touched a leper, you could get unclean. But for Jesus, him touching the leper cleanses the leper. Because there's something greater at work in Jesus. And through those that he calls... How about Lazarus? What happened to Lazarus? What did Jesus do to Lazarus? Somebody said it louder. I can't hear you from there. He raised him from the dead. 
Yeeha! Yeah, who wants to see somebody get raised from the dead? I would like to see that someday, right? I've seen other healings. I haven't seen that yet. How about, uh, how about, let's see here. How about blind Bartimaeus? What did Jesus do? Oh, just struggle with your affliction. Is that what he said to, to blind Bartimaeus? Is that what he said to him? Oh, just offer it up. Did he say that? Come on. Yes or no? No. Homily, by the way, means conversation. It doesn't mean lecture. Okay? So that's why I'm trying to engage you all in a conversation this morning. Right. He said, he asked him. He did give him a choice. He says, what do you want me to do for you? And blind Bartimaeus says, Master, I want to see. And Jesus says, Nah, that's too much for you. Now, what does he say? He says, may it be done unto you according to your faith. What you believe I can do for you, may it be done to you. Because brothers and sisters, and I do call you that because that is who you are. I'm not just your spiritual father, I'm also a brother in Christ. God has called each and every single one of us. And we heard that in the second reading to the Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians. God called each and every single one of us to receive every spiritual blessing in the heavens. And and he did that before he ever created the world. Again, remember, there's no time for God. So the moment that God created the world is the same moment that you came into existence when you were conceived. Is the same moment when Jesus is going to raise us all from the dead. According to Scripture, according to God's way of looking at things, he says that the Lamb, Jesus, right? Because Jesus is the Lamb of God. Yes or yes? Yes, good. Okay, so Jesus is the Lamb of God. And it says in Scripture that the Lamb was slain before the foundations of the world. And that's, again, one of those things where I'm like, wait a minute. Didn't he die in 33 AD? Yes. Right, but in God's view of things, Jesus died before the foundations of the world. And what's going to happen when the world ends? What's going to happen? We, we say it all the time and we profess it in our creed and everything like that. What? Jesus is going to come again and judge the living and the dead, right? And then all of those who belong to him are going to, re, going to go into heaven and body and soul So literally, Jesus' victory from the cross is going to be made manifest for everybody. And it's a victory that will even defeat death. That's why Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, to show that this is possible. Here's a foretaste, basically. Of course, we know that Lazarus died again, but I'm sure... He had a lot of hope that it's very true that he will be raised from the dead again because he actually experienced it. God is not a God who asks you to believe in him without first seeing what he does. And that's in the catechism. God, in showing himself to humanity, it wasn't humanity who sat around and thought about God or looked up at the stars and said, oh, those look like distant campfires. Let's not think they were dumb. But it was God who encountered mankind, who showed himself to mankind, slowly but surely revealing himself. And so likewise, in our individual lives, God does this. He shows himself so that we can then have faith that the greater things that he has said has happened. Would you like an example of that? No? Okay. All right. Yes, okay, good. All right, because I can say that, but then if I don't back it up, it's like, yeah, right, I'm triggering your baloney button. Baloney, or whatever you use, whatever other words, maybe two words that you want to use for that, which I'd get in trouble if I said. So Good Friday, Good Friday, I keep saying it's Good Friday. It was a Good Friday. Black Friday. How many of you like to go out shopping on Black Friday? Yeah, all right, get the sales, right? Well, I decided it would be a good day to ask some of the parishioners of St. Thomas Aquinas to go out and do some real savings. That is, we prayed. I actually had one high school student and one college student among the people who were praying 
to find out from God who God wanted, the groups that were going to go out and pray for people, who God wanted to heal. The college student said, okay, Walmart, something yellow, right? Meaning, go to Walmart. God says, go to Walmart. By the way, she'd never done this before. God says, go to Walmart. Somebody's wearing something yellow. They have a mask, and they've got abdominal pain. Pretty specific, right? Yes? Right, okay. So, and then the high schooler said, um, someone named Rachel... And, by the way, her issue is abortion. Okay? All right? So, I went to Walmart with my prayer partner, and at first I thought it was some of the, like, the, the guys who are outside with their yellow vests, right? Because they have the masks. How many of you have been to Walmart? I mean, you've been to Walmart, right? So, you see the folks outside with the carts, right? So, I thought it was one of them. I come up to the first guy, and I'm like, excuse me, like, we were praying at church. And the guy's kind of like, go away from me, weirdo. Right? How many of you would probably do that? I wasn't dressed up as a priest, by the way. I was in regular clothes because I figured it would be less of a shock that way. Okay, so then I tried to go to somebody else, one other guy doing the carts, and I'm like, you know, hey, uh, we were praying at my church. He's like, look, man, I don't even believe in any of that stuff. I'm like, okay, all right, it's not for them. Trial and error, right? There's nothing wrong with trial and error, is there? Because if at first you don't succeed, what did they say? Try, try again. So I go into Walmart, and there's one of our parishioners who happens to work for Walmart. I'm like, oh, hey, Ellen. She recognizes me even if I was in regular clothes, right? And I said, hey, listen, we were praying, and, and this is what we got, you know, somebody wearing a mask, wearing something yellow uh, uh, at Walmart with abdominal pain. And she says, well, you know, all of us in the front, we all wear yellow vests, so it could be anybody in the front section here. So... She literally brought me. It's easier when you have somebody who the other people can connect to, right? So she brought me to, like, the first person that we met. And she says, hey, do you have abdominal pain? And the person's like, no. And then the next woman we meet, she says, hey, do you have abdominal pain? And, um, and, and the woman says, yes. And she says, oh, great. You know, this is Father Chris and, and his friend, and they're going to pray for you. She's like, oh, great. Wonderful. I know Jesus, and I know he works miracles. I was like, okay, good. This is easy. I don't have to introduce the woman to Jesus. I don't have to convince her that he does actually work miracles still today, here, now. So we pray, and she says, well, right now there's, no, there's not much change, but I believe that I'm going to be healed. I checked back to Walmart the next day. I actually had to pick some stuff up. I saw Ellen. I checked with her. She says, oh, yeah, Debbie... Uh, yeah, she's, I checked with her. She's feeling great today. She was healed. Like, praise God. Anyway, back to Friday. Sorry, I'm Irish. I go around sometimes in these little journeys. It's kind of like how God uses grace sometimes. Loop, 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 all over the place. Okay, so Friday. So we're walking out, my friend Eddie and I, my prayer partner. And somebody recognizes him because Eddie used to run a gas station. And they, they stop in their vehicle and they're talking to him. And I see that the guy has this, like, bright... Uh, fluorescent yellow cap and Eddie's thinking we've got more important things to do like we got to get to the mall or something like that and pray for the real people who are supposed to be prayed for and I'm like Eddie let's stop and talk to these folks so you know the guy asked hey what are you, what are you doing and I, and I literally said hey we're praying for people and, and the, guy, the guy stops he, he pulls the car into the parking lot we pray with him um, and it turns out they had been in a car accident, he and his wife, she was in the car too, and she lost her child. She was pregnant, eight months pregnant, and that's, that's, that, just, that just saddens me. So I was filled with compassion, and we prayed that God may give them consolation, but also the future hope that God's going to make up for anything that he allowed to happen. Because in Scripture, it does say that. And so you can tell God, listen, hey God, you said this. I'm going to hold you to it. And you can test God that way. You can't test God by, like, drinking poison on purpose or throwing yourself off of a building on purpose. Don't do that, okay? But you can test God when he says one thing and you say, okay, God, I've never seen that before, but I'd like to see that happen. All right, so... I asked the other, the, the husband, hey, do you still have anything physically wrong with you? 
And he says, yeah, um, I've got some leg pain. Okay, how about we pray for it? He's like, okay. So we pray, the leg pain goes away. Now, it had, on a scale of one to 10, it was three, right? So I said, I said, okay, you're not feeling it now. Get out of your truck, test it out, like get on your feet. So he does, and he, he realizes, oh, it's gone. And I said, yes, praise Jesus. Then I said, listen, look, if God did something small for you like that, you then know that he's going to be willing to do something even greater. And, he, and, he, and the, the lights went on in his eyes. And he said, that's true. As brothers and sisters, this is very true. If God is willing to do something small for us, he's willing to do something much greater. And sometimes that's how God acts. When we ask for him to, to, to do something in our lives, when we ask for an answer to prayer, there might be a small gift, and he may want us to pay attention to it. Because then when we pay attention to it, we can say, ah, I see you operating, God. I thank you, and that it increases my faith that you're going to do even more. But also there's something else we can do. It's called using our heads, using reason, okay? Because faith tells us certain things, but so does reason. Faith tells us that God, who did not spare his only son, but gave him up for us, gave us the gift of Jesus, that he will certainly give us everything besides, right? How many of you imagine that if a trillionaire gave you a trillion dollars, right, and then you come to them asking for $50, do you think that they're going to turn you away after they've given you a trillion dollars? No. Good. I've got at least one person who's paying attention. I bored the rest of you asleep already, huh? <laughs> so, oh, oh, one of the, one of the, um, one of the pot stirrers says, no, that's good. I've got your attention then. Okay? Because Jesus is the greatest gift that we ever have. And if God is willing to give us Jesus, what else is he willing to give us? Dream with me, folks. And the reason I say this is very simply put. What happens in heaven? Is there any disease in heaven? Yes or no? No. Good. Somebody knows that in heaven everybody is healed, right? Yes? Yes? Okay. So what happens when you pray for somebody to be healed and they're healed? What does that mean has happened? Let me tell you what it means. It means that we've literally taken... God's kingdom and made it manifest here on earth. How many of you would like to see God's kingdom a little bit more manifest on earth? Right? I would. I certainly would. People getting healed. People getting restored. So, some folks had a heart to do that. Uh, A group called Encounter Ministries. And they went into a high school in the Diocese of Lansing, Michigan. And talked to a Catholic high school student, just like y'all. Taught them about what God likes to do. Prayed for them so that they could receive the gifts that God gives in confirmation. Not just knowledge, understanding, wisdom, courage, counsel. I'm sure you had to memorize the list, right? But also healing, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, gifts of tongues, gifts of prophecy. All those things that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. The fun gifts, I call those. So don't take my word for it. I'm going to give this to Mrs. Pinsano for, for you all to look at someday. And if you ever want anybody to come and pray with you or teach you about that, I'm happy to come back. But I know I've already gone 24 minutes. Oops. <laughs> oh, wait. Whatever time I take here, you have less time in school for, right? <laughs> Yes! All right. So, so, but here's the thing. Okay, so we've given some knowledge and some understanding, right, that things are a little bit outside of God. For God, all things are possible, and God will literally take things that are future, like heaven, and bring them into earth. Now we have to apply wisdom to it, okay? Now, here's the thing. You're already doing it. You just don't know it. Because every time we say the Our Father... We are literally asking God for his kingdom to come. When? When are we asking for that kingdom to come? In the future? When? Now. 
So literally, we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. May it come now. We want to see your kingdom made manifest, God. Thy will be done. When? When everybody goes to heaven? No. On earth as it is in heaven. So every time you say the Our Father, you are literally asking God, number one, to have his kingdom be made manifest, which means bringing forth healing, all that kinds of stuff that happens in heaven, and and that you are signing up to be the ones to do his will. Because it was Jesus, when he sent his disciples, not just the apostles, not just the special people, every single disciple, he said, he gave them the command, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. How many of you would like to see somebody get healed because you prayed and Jesus answered your prayer right then and there? I certainly like to see that every time I see it. It gets exciting, and I know it's Jesus who is glorified because Jesus knows where I've been. I wasn't always a priest. He knows where I've been, but he also knows where I'm going. He knows where every single one of you have been, but he also knows where you're going. So what we want to do is we want to say yes to what Jesus said. Mary, when she got the message, right, that she was going to become the mother of Jesus, what did she say? What was her response? Well, first she had a little bit of doubt, right, about how it was possible because she wasn't in the part of her marriage at that point where they were living together. Long story has to do with Hebrew marriages being first a contract and then they come together to live together. Imagine waiting a year to consummate your wedding. Father, I'm sure you didn't wait a year, right? Because you know Father is a Melkite priest and he's married, so uh, he, he has both benefits of being a priest and being married. So, um, but Mary, once she heard that something she thought was impossible was possible, that her cousin Elizabeth had conceived in her old age, She got some hope that the angel was right when he said nothing is impossible with God. So then she turns around and says what? Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done unto me according to your word. So today we want to imitate our mother because like mother, like daughter, like mother, like son, right? We want to imitate our mother by saying to God, God, this is what your word says about what disciples are supposed to be. That we're supposed to be people who bring the kingdom of God to our present day circumstances. We've never seen it before, God, but hey, you're able to show us things we've never seen before, just like if we've never experienced a crepe in Paris, France. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but if we go there and actually experience it, then we know what it's actually like, right? We can read about it, we can understand it, but to actually go there and experience it is something different. So we ask God to do that with us too. To have us not just have the idea or have some understanding, but literally that we see God invade our lives today. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So we just met the same Jesus who was slain before the foundations of the world, right? And who is seated gloriously on the throne with God the Father in heaven. By the way, the fact that God is outside of time is how come God can link every Mass to the Last Supper and to the cross and to every single Mass throughout time, and to the liturgy in heaven. But as I was giving out communion and giving blessings, I could tell that God was touching people. So if you feel a little bit different after Mass, after receiving communion, receiving a blessing, raise your hand. Don't be shy. Oh, one, two, three, four. Anybody experience significant healing, like lessening of pain? Anybody? Are you for real, or are you just being a pot stirrer? You're for real? Okay, what did you have before Mass? Your knee hurt. Scale of 1 to 10, what, ha- what, what was it before Mass? Two. Two? What is it now? Zero. Awesome. And it wasn't just from my long homilies. <laughs> All right. Uh, one more thing I forgot to mention in my homily, because I'm Irish and sometimes I forget things, right? I mentioned the high school student who prayed and said I was going to encounter a Rachel and the issue was abortion. Well, here's the thing. Sometimes God gives people something direct, like the college student, Walmart, yellow yellow thing, mask, 
abdominal pain. And sometimes God gives it in figurative ways, and you realize it afterwards. The woman who had experienced a miscarriage. In the Old Testament and in Matthew's Gospel, it says that Rachel was the one who mourns for her children because they are no more. Would you say that that woman was mourning for the loss of her child? Yes. What do they call a miscarriage in medical terms? A spontaneous abortion, as opposed to a procured abortion. So the high school student was also right. So what I want to do is I want to encourage you. You can hear from God too. You can bring God's kingdom here. You can pray for each other. And I know God wants to use you. And you don't have to be a saint already. Because God picks us all, calls us all, and lets us all play in his kingdom.